Good evening, everyone. Hopefully I'm now live on Facebook. Hopefully you can hear what I'm saying. It's very disconcerting this. I've done a few presentations online where it's challenging to gauge what the audience reaction is. But it's normally on Zoom or another platform like that where people are at least in the same room. Whereas I'm just sending out into the ether. Who knows if anyone's watching, but hello, hopefully you are. My name is Jim, and I am going to be talking about surveying trees for bats and posing the question of can we do better? So this is a, a presentation that I delivered at the Bat Conference and ARB Conference in 2017 and 2018, and really kind of just sharing some of the initial findings of my work looking at how bats use trees. and. I presented it and kind of assumed, okay, well, the information is out there now, people are aware of this. But on a recent training course that I was delivering, I realized that actually this information hasn't still kind of made its way to everyone. Clearly, there's only a small number of people who were able to join me on that day or attend the conferences on those days. And equally, even if people had attended, who knows if they still remember it? You know, we receive so much information at these conferences that inevitably there's going to be a certain amount of in one ear and out the other one. So I thought I would deliver this Facebook Live just so then it's accessible to anyone who wants to see it. And really this is a kind of a forerunner to this year's BAT and ARB conference. So I'm speaking at the BAT conference alongside Karis, who is an MSc student who's looking at the use of the trail cam data that we have captured over the last few years. And I'll touch on that towards the end of today's session. And I'm speaking at the ARB Association conference as well. So if you are attending one of those, hopefully this is useful background information. If you don't currently have plans to attend those, uh, I think you can still get tickets or perhaps maybe today was the last day. Who knows? Uh, but tough luck. You should have signed up earlier on. Um, anyway, so the topic of what we're going to be talking about is surveying trees for bats, as I've mentioned. And if you like what you see, presumably you already follow me, like me on Facebook. So that's Bats RTS. Uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, I'm having a bit of a drive and a push to try and get more subscribers to my YouTube channel. And so if you like the videos and the other visual content that you see this evening, head on over, in fact, do it now, head over to youtube.com slash at Bats in Trees and subscribe to that channel because I try to share as much as I can through that channel, including videos of Bats in Trees as the name of the channel suggests, but also I've got some other resources such as Bat ID videos on there as well. Cool, okay, so on to the main event. I've been working with bats for a number of years and kind of left ecology for a while. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm an ecologist and an arboriculturist. I got fed up of the late nights and early mornings required to survey for bats. So I decided to retrain in arboriculture because trees are there during the day and they don't hibernate over the winter. So having left ecology and moved into arboriculture, I learned more about trees. So as you can imagine, where bats live in trees, I get particularly excited. So I focus more and more of my time on how bats use trees. And in 2015, pretty much dedicated all of my time to it, really, and was lucky enough to be joined by a range of wonderful people who just wanted to go out and climb trees and start looking for bats. And so that's kind of what we did. And so the plan initially was that we would go out, we look for holes in trees and we would check them once a month if we thought they were good for bats. And unfortunately, we didn't find very much. So this is kind of what we were faced with time and time again, that we'd climb up into a tree, we'd find a feature we thought looked okay, and we put the endoscope in and no bats in there. And very soon, we began to realize that this is kind of commonplace. We chatted to other people doing similar research and very soon found out that the vast majority of tree roosts are more likely to be empty than they are occupied. 
And just think about that for a second, especially those of you working in consultancy who are being paid to determine presence absence and inform your clients about whether bats are roosting in trees, that the deck is really stacked against this. So 95% of the tree roost, and those are the tree roosts, so where bats are known to roost in the trees, 95% of those are more likely to be empty than occupied. So we visited a lot of these trees for at least 12 months. So we did one visit a month, and are more than 50% of those visits, sorry, in 95% of the cases, on more than 50% of those visits, the features were more likely to be empty than occupied. And this is quite worrying, really. Here's an example of one. So this is a fairly low level tree roost. I think it's becoming more and more widely understood now that those big old trees, you know, with the features somewhere up in the crown, which we once thought were home for bats, actually that's kind of nonsense that bats will use whatever feature wherever it is in the tree. Height kind of has a relevance maybe for maternity roosts, but less so at other times of years. And we think about it for some species, such as our Bechstein's bats, brown long-eared bats that have very broad wings that may even forage on the ground. Why wouldn't they also roost near the ground? And so here's a, a tree Then we checked 12 times across the course of a year. In fact, this has probably been checked maybe for about three years in total now, uh, almost on a monthly basis. And during the first year that we checked it, we found bats once. And that was in May. And these are the bats here. So 11 out of the 12 visits we made, we didn't find any bats at all. But when we did find bats, we found some really interesting ones. We found some Bechstein's bats and a, a maternity group forming here. And this was in a woodland who I was working with a, a friend of mine, Keith Cohen. Hi, Keith, if you're watching. And he started talking about this idea of chairs and perhaps bats roost are a bit like chairs. And it got me thinking about my chair collection. So I've got 21 chairs at home, not bragging. The top left is my, my favorite one. That's the sofa in our lounge. We've just moved house actually. And this was bought for a lounge that was about seven meters long. We have much smaller lounge now, but we're really low to get rid of it because it's just so comfortable and we can't find anything else quite like it. You can throw yourself in behind the poof there. You can sit at one end where the fox is. It's just, there's a whole variety of ways that you can sit in that chair. It's fantastic. It gets used pretty much every single day. In the old house, the one below it, that kind of round, what we used to call the love chair, uh, that was kind of at the other end of the lounge, closer towards the fire. So it got used more frequently during the winter months because we wanted to be warm. But every now and then I would go to use it and find that I've been out competed. And these are the dominant species in my house, the two dogs, Willow and Bracken. I've got one sat next to me just now. And then I've got chairs that I use every day, the one top center. I think this is the first time I've ever delivered this talk and I'm physically sat in that chair. Good chair, this one. I've been sat in it all day long. I've got other chairs that will only get used at certain times of year. So top right, we've got really nice outdoor chairs that have been hidden away in the summer house, waiting for some good sunny weather. We've got some other outdoor chairs that we kind of less fussy about. They stay outside for most of the year down in the bottom right, but clearly they're not really going to get used in December, mainly kind of in the summer months. And then I've got other chairs, like the one centre uh, bottom, that pretty much only get used at Christmas. You know, when you've had to kind of grab anything that you could physically sit on and bring it into the house to get everyone around the table. So most of the time, they're kind of just covered in clutter, making them unusable at that time. But you can kind of drag them out as and when needed. And so it got us thinking about, you know, chair collections being a little bit like tree roosts. They're more likely to be empty than they are occupied. The vast majority of the time, no one is sitting in them. But they're clearly really important, right? We need them. We need chairs that we can sit in front of the TV with. We need chairs that we can sit up to the table with. Office chairs, outdoor chairs. And we kind of need a variety of them to suit whatever it is we're planning to do that day. And clearly, we need all of them. And some perhaps are more crucial than others. So the sofa in the lounge, if we lost that, that would be absolutely devastating. And I think one day we're going to have to make the decision and bite the bullet and get rid of it and buy something smaller for this house. And then there's other chairs, like I've got 
five of those outdoor chairs for sitting out in the summer months. If I lost one of those, it's probably not going to be a big deal. So thinking about these kind of disadvantages and the, the challenges we face when trying to find bats in trees, kind of something I want to explore for the next half an hour or so. And to kind of kick us off, I think one of the challenges we face is that with trees and bats, that it's only fairly recently that ecologists have climbed trees, certainly en masse. You know, I'm sure there have been a few specialists over the years that have been climbing them, but it's only the last maybe five, ten years that people have got really interested in this. And more and more ecologists are learning to climb trees. And equally, more arborists who are fantastic at climbing trees are interested in learning more about bats. And so it's no wonder really that we're at a bit of a disadvantage and it can be challenging to find bats in trees or we know very little about them because we're just not getting up and close and personal to them. When we think about bats in buildings, we can physically get inside, you can climb in the loft space, you know, kind of root around, look for droppings, look for bats themselves. But with trees, you know, we don't routinely go climbing trees or rooting around in the, the center of woodpecker holes, for example. And so historically, our approaches to survey has been relying on standing on the ground and trying to watch the bats either leave the roost or go back into the roost during an emergence or re-entry survey. And it kind of got me thinking that really this is a kind of odd thing to do if you think about the overall aims of what we're trying to achieve. And it got me thinking about the kind of, well, what else we, could we do and like the pros and cons of these two approaches that if we have a box, so this is our mystery box here, and I want to know what's in this box. And it's kind of two ways I could find that out. So I can either walk over to the box, I can open the box and have a look inside and yay, we got some bats. Straightforward, right? Nice and straightforward, simple, definitive answer, fantastic. Or we could put the box on a, a tall shelf. We could walk to the other side of the room. We could wait for it to get dark. And then we could try and watch or perhaps in reality listen to see if anything comes out of that box. And I know that things have improved recently with the kind of move towards the kind of night vision aids to supplement surveyors' eyes on surveys. But still, we're at a significant disadvantage because we're putting ourselves some distance away from the feature that we're trying to look at. And we're all eagerly awaiting the fourth edition of the bat survey guidance. But as it currently stands, the standard approach is to look at trees from ground level, identify potential roost features, then get up close to have a look at them, determine whether we think they're suitable. And then for the final stays of the presence absence, come back down to the ground to watch any bats coming out or going back in. So yeah, we're kind of this disadvantage. And I think we're also removed as ecologists. We don't get to know our subjects. And by subjects here, I'm talking about trees. I'm not talking about the bats. If we want to truly be able to survey tree bat survey trees for bats effectively, we need to know more about the trees themselves. And we kind of will accelerate that learning if we start looking at trees, understand how they grow, understand how they decay, and how these features form. When thinking about other disadvantages of these methods as well, we've seen a kind of shift away recently from dawn surveys, certainly as a kind of standard approach. And this is largely based on the evidence gathered together in this literature review, one of the fantastic documents put together by the Bat Tree and Bat Rock Habitat King. And it's kind of a really obvious thing to do, but essentially, you know, just find out when bats leave and when bats return to roosts. And it's taking just one species here. This is just based on Matt Zill's work on barbs. That amazingly, during that study, the bats were returning to the roost between three and four hours before sunrise. And of course, for our dawn re-entry surveys, the standard window is maybe two or one and a half hours before sunrise. So the bats are already in the tree roost before we even turn up have dragged ourselves out of bed to start this horrendous dawn survey. And no wonder why we don't find any bats going back to them. And this is not just the case for Barbara Stale, it's the case for uh, other species as well. I vividly remember this kind of links to my personal experience as well, sitting down two hours before sunrise, 
my bum literally hit the seat and a common pipistrel went into a building tucked under itself under a tile in the building and I thought well pipistrels are one of our least light averse species and if they're happy to return to roost two hours before sunrise anything can. So it really called into question the, the value of these types of surveys, certainly for kind of presence absence. I can understand the value for maybe determining exact roosting location and observing other behavior. So what else can we look for then? Typically when we survey for bats in buildings, one of the fantastic signs that we look for are bat droppings because these persist in the roost long after the bats have gone. So you could go and have a look at it in the winter and hopefully you still find your bat droppings. And that gives you an indication that that's a bat roost and then you can plan your surveys accordingly. The reality is though that trees are very different to buildings, that they're dynamic living environments. And so very few tree roosts have droppings in them. I think there's several reasons for this. So some, the droppings just don't collect in the first place, they just fall straight out. Others, they get kind of massed in the detritus at the base of the roost. So you can see on the left hand side, just a few scattered droppings in amongst the frass, the kind of wood decay at the base there. The tree on the right is kind of almost what I think most people envisage we would find when there are bats present. So, you know, just a huge number of bat droppings that make our life easy. But time after time after time, I find no bat droppings in known bat roosts because they just come and go so quickly. Thinking about other things that we can look for then, we worked out that actually the bat flies, some of these parasites that live on bats during the summer months are really interesting because they persist over the winter months. So, the bats might be there and present in the summer months and then they can disappear, especially in the case of Becksteins. But these parasites can persist for a long period of time. And in actual fact, they're a fantastic indicator for when we're looking in these cavities during the winter months. And sometimes they're easy to spot. You can kind of just make out the ones on the right-hand side there, these kind of just round, black, shiny cases that are stuck to the sides of roosts. But other times they kind of get dis kind of camouflage into the, the feature itself. And one thing I find is that if the hole is quite small, the cavity is small, then you're more likely to find these, the larger the feature is internally. So I've got some roost that maybe go up about a meter and a half internally. You find very, you know, fewer of these. I presume they're still there. We just don't come across them as readily with the endoscope. Thinking about other things that we can look for or perhaps smell for. One of the things we started doing at this site was to go up and make sure we have a good sniff of the feature itself. And these features we both, uh, we both checked first time in June and both of them had a really strong smell of bats in June. And we checked them monthly, there were no bats present originally. We checked them monthly from there on in the one on the left, we eventually found bats in, in, in December. And the one on the right, we eventually found bats in it in March. And clearly the bats were coming and going when we weren't there. It just, you know, leaving their smell there. So we have to rely on as many things as we can because pinning down the bats themselves are really challenging. <clears throat> Similar to the last two trees, we first started checking this one in June and we checked it every single month and it wasn't until a year later that we actually found bats in it and it had a really really strong smell of bats in it that big pile of droppings I showed you a minute ago is also from this tree roost so smells are a really useful feature and one thing that we're kind of noticing as well is that you can perhaps even start to begin to differentiate species once you get your nose in sometimes you know if you've ever opened a bat box with noctuals in it it's a really overpowering smell isn't it whereas the smell of Becksteins there who kind of co-occupy this roost on a timeshare basis smells subtly different all of these things though kind of 
rely on the bats being there relatively recently, though, I guess, you know, the bats themselves or droppings or parasite cases or the smell. But one of the things that came out, certainly from the Battery Habitat Key project, but also kind of echoed in our research and many other people's, is this idea of what the substrate is like. So here we've got two features that are just full of loose material and you put the endoscope in and loads of detritus falls out. If we think about these features, they once were solid wood. And then they've been damaged, they've gone through a process of dysfunction and decay, that wood gets broken down slightly, it turns into large chunks, and you get kind of various detritivores eating it and digesting it and breaking it up, and it breaks it into kind of large clumps like we've seen there. And if you put an endoscope into a tree and loose material falls out, to me that would suggest that nothing's really going in and out in there other than maybe some invertebrates. When we get to a point where the endoscope goes in and no loose material falls out, then perhaps that suggests that something is physically knocking it out. And in these cases, we've got no loose material, but the kind of the edges of these are a bit fuzzy, they're kind of dusty, there's some loose material on the very edge, and we can continue along this spectrum again. So we still have no loose material here, and the edges of the cavity here are clean. There's no kind of fuzziness to them at all. We may even have some kind of waxiness or blackening in places. And this is where bats are going in and just wearing across the substrate here and kind of knocking any loose material off and just you know, polishing it essentially with their body movements coming in and out. And it's not just bat roost that we see this. So in my house where I put my hand on the banister, I noticed that I kind of leave a like waxy residue where clearly my hands aren't as clean as I thought they were. And I haven't grown in height since I've lived there. So I keep grabbing the banister at the same point and I deposit these kind of waxy residues and eventually that kind of turned black and every now and then I have to kind of clean it off. So I'm leaving the kind of oils being deposited from my skin. And we went to a see a play at a theatre in Bristol near where I live called the Bristol Old Vic and it's a wonderful old building I think about 400 years old or something like that and right at the top they have the seats and the gods and they're the original seats you can't sit in them anymore they're kind of there for posterity and if you look at these chairs they're made of this really kind of gnarly wood that's rough and, you know and clearly the hand tools they had and precision they had 400 years ago it's not the same as what we have now but if you look at the handholds where people were physically grabbing hold of them to lift themselves in and out of those seats over centuries, they're smooth and they're highly polished. And it's the same action that we're seeing here. So you can see these two substrates here of just nothing loose in the cavity, clean substrates and the kind of the waxiness and the blackening we see as well. The one exception to this or well, not one exception, one of the exceptions to this is flaking bark. So whenever you look under flaking bark, you see this kind of loose detritus and it never develops that kind of clean, smooth, polished substrate underneath because before it's had chance to do that, of course, the piece of bark has fallen off. So it presents challenges when we're looking at certain types of features like flaking bark. So putting all of this together then, for our presence absence surveys, where the current guidance says we should come back down to the ground, really we should be looking at undertaking some aerial inspection of some sort or another as standard, because we have cues not only for the bats, but we have opportunities to see droppings, we see the parasites in there as well, but perhaps most crucially, the substrate conditions. You just don't get to see that if you're down on the ground. Clearly, there will be some trees that are unsafe to climb. There will be certain features like flaking bark that's really sensitive and is prone or you know, very likely to be damaged if the climber is not very skilled uh, or even if they are skilled, you know, accidents can happen. And so clearly there will be some cases where it's not appropriate, but this should be our default. And there are various kind of legal considerations with regards to the work at height regulations for this. So every single time we work at height, we need to justify why we've left the ground. 
So it's not just enough to say, you know, I want to look in it to see if there are bats, because you can determine whether there are bats from ground level reasonably well with the cameras. But if we want to look at the substrate, the parasites, the droppings, the smell, then that's giving us more and more justification to actually work at height. One of the really interesting things that came out because we were climbing year round was thinking about seasonality. And if we were looking for this species here, great crested newt, if we were looking for it in spring months, we would go to one of these ponds perhaps and have a look around that, maybe look for eggs or do a torch survey or eDNA or whatever it is. If however, it was August or September, you know, this time of year, we're not really gonna be looking in the ponds because we know they won't be there. So we use our knowledge of the species to help us design our surveys, but we don't do this for bats. And I think it's because we historically have been so heavily reliant on emergent surveys. And of course, they can only be undertaken whilst the bats are active. So between April and September with May and August being considered the kind of the optimal months. But what's really interesting when we actually started climbing these trees month on month was finding the activity at different times of year. So this is one of my favorite tree roosts, unfortunately fell over last winter. So the tree roosts that were in this tree are now lost. And in July, we had some natural bats on the left here. We also had them in September. So outside of that kind of optimal period, we would consider for emergent surveys. And on the right, we had nocturnal bats that pretty much occupied the feature all the way through the winter. So they turned up in November and they eventually left in March. So our standard surveys of doing bat emergence or dorm re-entry surveys are just not going to do justice certainly to the nocturnal bats. And it was likely that we, not, we might miss some of the natural bats here as well. So you know, had nothing in May, nothing in June, towards the end of July we had these bats and again we had them in September. So bats will move around throughout the year. And when we started looking at these roosts, especially the kind of winter roost, I was always told that, you know, bats need stable temperatures that are humid to see them through the winter. And to achieve that, they need, you know, presumably really thick trunk trees. And there's still guidance out there now that say that bats will hibernate only in large hollow trees. These photos were taken in January and February, respectively. And these are just taken with a camera from the outside of the tree. So the one on the left is a torch shining on the bat. The one on the right is daylight. And you can kind of see the water pouring over the bat on the one on the left. That, and when I started thinking about it, my knowledge of things like railway tunnels where bats hibernate, quite often they're near the entrance. And it got me thinking, well, presumably bats need to know what the external conditions are like. because if it's suitable, if it suddenly warms up, then they can go out and forage perhaps, or take on moisture or you know, urinate, defecate, whatever they need to do. And this idea of bats tucking themselves away in hibernation and not being seen to spring, we know is not true. And some of those winters were mild, but then this one really interests me that found this low level tree roost, it was minus five degrees outside. And this bat was tucked behind this feature, it was about 10 centimeters above the entrance and the wood itself was maybe two centimeters thick. But these features that bats require to see them through the winter, they don't need to be huge. So we need to kind of reframe what it is that bats are using. And I think time and time again, we are not doing justice to our bats that hibernate in trees. So if you think about our nocturnal bats, pretty much a tree obligate, aren't they? So I would argue if you have woodpecker holes and nocturnal bats in an area, then you're gonna have nocturnal bats hibernating in, in one of those woodpecker holes somewhere. But time and time again, I see reports that just dismiss trees as being unsuitable for hibernation because they're not large enough. They don't buffer the bats from the external conditions. So let's remember the bats are for Christmas true, not just for April to September. 
So I kind of posed the question when I first delivered this talk of, well, can we do better then? And initially, it was an exercise of just sharing all of this worry and anxiousness I had about surveying trees for bats. They're like, oh, God, like we have no idea what we're doing. We just don't find bats. Like, what can we do? And spoke other conferences and just passed that worry on to other people. And I kind of over time have helped us move forward, hopefully, hopefully. So one of the huge steps forward was the, the publication of the Battery Habitat Key book, Bat Roosting Trees. You're going to see a photo of it coming up in a second. If you survey trees for bats and you do not have a copy of that book, or if you survey trees for bats and you have a copy, but you have not read that book, what are you doing? It's a fantastic resource. It's the only evidence-based guidance we have. And we need to learn from that if we're going to move forward and improve things. So one of the criticisms of the kind of early work was that, well, you prospected and you went out and you found tree roost and largely they were for individual bats. So of course, you know, bats move about frequently and of course you're not finding that frequently. And of course, most tree roosts therefore are more likely to be empty than they are occupied. So I thought, okay, that's a fair point. And thought, well, let's go and find some maternity roost then. So in 2017, we did some radio tracking of Becksteins and Barwistow, and we found a number of roosts. And we used those roosts then to go out and perform the same exercise. So we climbed these trees once a month for 12 months. So a whole annual cycle. So by my reckoning, I think that's 48 opportunities to find, these are the Becksteins roosts. So four roosts, 12 visits, 48 opportunities to find bats. I've got no idea whether people can comment on Facebook Live. Laura's in the next room. Hopefully she's gonna hear me. How many times do you think we found bats? Some of you have seen this talk already, I'm sure. How many times out of those 48 opportunities do you think we found bats? Let's see if we can have comments. I'm gonna find out if, if this is even a thing. Is anything coming through? You're 30 seconds behind me, wow, okay. So I'm gonna to have to fill for another 30 seconds. So 48 opportunities, maternity roosts, some of these, the top left one was 42 bats. The bottom left one was about 30 bats. The one on the top right is 15 bats. And the one bottom right was about 26 bats. So we've had bids of 10 times, three times, seven times. You're all very pessimistic, aren't you? Wow, 48 visits. Surely we found bats more than that. 15, oh, someone's got more optimistic. Six and pessimistic again, cool, thank you. Uh, we found bats once, and this was the time. That's shocking, right? These are Annex 2 species. These are maternity roosts, the most significant types of roosts we can have in this country. And we found them once out of 48 opportunities. You may notice there, those of you who have spent good money on the British Standard, um, that the British Standard talks about features suitable for bats go in and they go up above the entrance. This is not true. Not true for a number of species. So that was Bexstein's bats. We know that uh, several species of pipistrels will roost below the entrance. Noctual bat is in the videos here. Both of these are maternity roosts, noctual bats and Bexstein's bats roosting below the entrance. So if you are going out and you're classifying trees, bear that in mind. I would argue that any woodpecker hole is gonna be suitable for maternity use. How about droppings then? I'm gonna beckon Laura back in. So we, we found bats once. Come on, we must be able to find droppings more frequently than that. Um, so how many times do you think we found droppings? So we saw this photo earlier on. Out of the 48 times or 48 opportunities to find droppings, what do you think? So you can just about make the droppings out here. This was one of the occasions. So you know it's at least one and it's Kind of tricky to see, isn't it? It wasn't like that obvious photo with loads and loads of droppings we saw earlier on. We have just a few droppings peppered throughout. Only at the same times of the bats. So that would only be one there, wouldn't it? Four, okay. 28, ooh, optimistic. Three, 
We've got quite a, a wide bracket of things. A few of you have been burned already, I can tell. We find droppings twice. And again, it kind of really brought home how challenging this is. The bats are not there. The droppings are not there. The two things that we rely on so much when it comes to building surveys, they're kind of useless when we're looking for bats in trees, which sounds mad, doesn't it? So overall, I think the kind of 2018 study we did primarily on Backsteins was a bit of a failure. Didn't find bats very often on one, one occasion. And we didn't find bat droppings either, two occasions out of 48. So I chalked it up as a failure. And when I reflected on it, it kind of makes sense, really, that I had a look at the what the recommendations are in the battery habitat key. So there's various caveats that go with these recommendations, but I told you that we were looking at maternity roosts. So I'm looking at just the two periods of the year that uh, correlate to those, so the pregnancy and nursery. And this is only where surveys are justified. So the recommendation will be 14 sequential visits in both of those periods. So clearly we got nowhere near that, did we? We did 12 visits per tree, whereas this is kind of suggesting that we need to get to 28 visits per tree. And when this was published, I think this is one of the reasons why people just don't have an engage with this document because it seems so far from what we see in the good practice guidance of two or three visits in the good practice guidance to you know, potentially surveying all the year round according to the battery habitat key and not only all year round, but actually a number of visits, you know, a hell of a lot of visits at times. But as I say, this comes with various caveats. And one of the suggestions is that this is only justified when there are not alternative options. So having a conversation, I think it was with Keith again, I think Keith had been talking to Annie from Jersey Bat Group about using whether we could use trail cameras on bat roosts to see if they are used by bats. And so I thought, okay, well, we'll give this a go then, shall we? And you may recognize this tree roost from earlier on. This is the one that the bats were in. And for some reason, I waited until I think it was either July or August by the time we actually had bats for the first time in the year. So halfway through the year. And I thought, great, I'm going to deploy this camera on the tree. And I'd heard some recommendations for putting camera traps for things like um, otters, where instead of facing the hole, you put them sideways on to kind of get movement back and forth. So we kind of positioned it up. And I was so excited. I thought, great, we've got bats came back the next month so excited to see well what did it capture then I'm going to have something right going to have some bats recorded on it and I came back and I found this that the arm I'd used just wasn't stable enough and the whole thing had swung upside down on the same day that it was deployed and so I had loads of videos just of the foliage behind the tree so not much use for what I was trying to achieve but then thought, OK, well, the next month we came back, we kind of shook ourselves off a bit and went, OK, we'll learn from our mistakes there then. And we thought, OK, well, we'll put it up on the next tree because I've talked about droppings earlier on. So we had droppings the following month. I thought, great, let's put it on that tree. And sure enough, we left it for a month. We came back a, a month later and bang, we had bats going into the tree. Success. Fantastic. And then we moved it again. So this is kind of getting towards the end of the year now. I think we're talking September and bang onto a different tree. We had success as well. So as I mentioned, I have no idea why I left it so long to deploy this thing in the first place, but I thought, okay, following year, let's go out and let's put cameras on all of these roofs at the same time. So we did it. And as you can see from the photos here, I hung them upside down because I didn't, I'm not going to make that mistake again. Oh no, my friends. So I hung them upside down. And as you can see, sideways on, positioned by these tree roosts. And throughout that year, three of the four cameras had evidence of bats roosting in the trees. So we recorded videos of bats coming and going from the trees. So it was only the one in the bottom right where the camera just didn't work essentially and it was actually mainly down to the um, battery life we were kind of struggling with how long the battery life would last initially and so it was more to do with that it's kind of technical difficulties more than anything else 
and we kind of collected them in at the end of the year and we'd had a really kind of torrential rain downpour I think over December and January I was quite late collecting them and unfortunately a number of them ended up getting inundated with water so I had to kind of chuck them it turns out trail cameras are not designed to be hung upside down because they've got holes in the bottom to plug all sorts of various cables in so again learning from my mistake and moving forward so we decided to apply for some funding we kind of had proof of concept of this but we needed to take it to the next level so we were fortunate enough to receive funding from the people's trust for endangered species and the arbor cultural association thank you so much to both of those organizations uh, and to still as well so there's two strands of this project one is surveying trees for bats and the other one is whether we can create bat roosts in trees by cutting holes in them so still we're very kind to give us some chainsaws for that side of the project so we kind of leveled up i guess i went from four cameras to about 50 cameras currently got now and initially they were paired so you can see in the photos here a whole load of cameras and they were put up in pairs so the idea was that one would take a photo and one would take a video and we tried to determine which setup was the best to see you know is one better than the other and a huge thanks to sean at arbology lee at grounded trees um mark sharples hello if you're watching all of you huge thanks to those three guys uh, for helping out with this and um kind of all the blood sweat and tears that we've kind of put in along the way i've had the privilege of largely being on the ground this is my kind of office for the days when we go out and i was responsible for giving them the cameras downloading data changing batteries and all those things and those guys did all the hard work and the climbing so as well as leveling up on the number of cameras and the kind of pairing of them we also upgraded to these more substantial brackets as well and so we are now in a position where we're kind of facing the roost we've got two of them side by side um on the whole we've not had any water ingress I think I've had one or two cameras that have failed over time, but have a much better success rate. And I can hear you all crying, what well, does it work, Jim? Does it work? What kind of stuff have you recorded? And we end up with lovely things like this. So this is one of the photos that Karis pulled out when she was trawling through all of the kind of thousands of video clips and photo clips. And she said it reminded her of the the queen i think the bohemian rhapsody album cover the four bats lining up there so clearly we've got the four cornerstones of rock here and i'm going to leave it there because if you want to find out what happened the year after that once we upgraded to those new brackets does it work which one's better is it a photo or is it a video you're going to have to come along to either the bat or the arb conference to find out I'm happy to take any questions if the technology works. Um, in the meantime, by all means, get in touch. If you want to ask any questions, I have a blog post on my website, which is just batlicense.co.uk, um, where I talk through all of the different equipment that we use. So the brackets, the cameras themselves, the battery packs, all of those types of things. I'm going to be posting some videos about how we set them up as well. So the position of the cameras, the settings on the cameras, distance away from the entrances, all of those types of things. And so feel free to kind of head over there to find that out, have a look at the various social pages to kind of wait for updates about those videos as well. And as I mentioned earlier on, if you haven't done already, head over to the YouTube channel at Bats in Trees and click the little subscribe button on there. It will help me out a great deal. It means you'll be one of the first people to see the kind of the videos when they get published on there as well. Uh, I posed one of the questions in my abstract for the two conferences we're speaking at this year. I said, you need to come along if you want to find out who wins in a fight between a noctual and a gray squirrel. So soon enough, the video of that altercation between the noctual and the gray squirrel will also be on the YouTube channel as well. I can see some things coming my way. Cool, right, what have we got? Um, do, do, do. Jez Martin says he found a roost uh, 40 centimeters above ground. It's crazy, right? So I think the lowest known tree roost is 26 centimeters above the ground. But absolutely, this idea of us looking up and looking in the crown of the tree, 
we need to get past that that bats are all around us aren't they all different heights depending on what species they are um also found when we were out putting dormice boxes up once we put some um, boxes on a piece of hazel we stopped for a cup of tea notice the feature in the hazel so put the endoscope in there and sure enough we found the brown long-eared and then a few weeks later other people are finding bats in hazel and then we find another one and is in there as well um Will the talk be available afterwards? <laughs> Lovely, yeah. It, I think Laura's already responded saying yes. Yeah, so it's um, Facebook. I think save it to the, the feed anyway. Um, has put paper in the bottom of the tree roost and found droppings thanks to that. Oh, okay, that's interesting. And presumably that just gives you a kind of a layer between the general detritus and the bottom of the roost. Interesting, I'll have to see um, if I can get that working. Um, question from John Parker of whether I think bats switch maternity roosts more frequently than doing buildings. Um, to be honest, John, I don't know. Um, there's some logic there, I guess, in that uh, I recently had the privilege of checking the bat boxes at Brackett's Coppice and there's 121 Becksteins in one of those big boxes there. And the number of bed bugs and other creepy crawly things they sent me up with this big sock to put over the box and said go on Jim it's fine yeah go and do that and I took the door off and it just rained parasites into the bag and I was shaking them out of my t-shirt and my clothes for days afterwards and it kind of makes sense right that these are natural living environments that the parasites that will visit bats in them are more likely to persist, persist in those um, than in a kind of inert building because it's dry and the humidity you know much reduced and it's just kind of more sterile than a natural tree roost come on then bracken come on i've been visited by one of the dogs come and say hello yeah go on have you come there we go come and say hello to everyone this is bracken everyone she clearly didn't want to miss out on the conversations and the questions are you going to answer the next question bracken um so anna asks how close do you think you're getting to all of these uh, insights on bats and trees, <laughs> how close are they being in the guidance? Um, I, not a question for me, I'm afraid. Um, the, I appreciate this is terrible timing um, for the next edition of the guidance, because as we are aware, and I saw Richard Compton posting this morning, hi Rich, um, that the, the guidance, I saw the cover of it. Did you see the cover? I really like the cover, just bats. Get rid of the people, just put the bats on it. I liked it a lot. Um, the yeah we're expecting the guidance in september so i've known for a while that this won't make it into there however i assume like the last version of the guidance there will be a line in there that says you know if if research kind of produces new findings or there's a better way of doing things then there's a reasonable justification to deviate from guidance because let's remember it's guidance and we need to use our professional knowledge skills and judgment when applying it Oh, cool. I have one more question. So we do one more and then uh, I'll let everyone go. We need to, Friday is pizza day in our house. So we have dough currently proving next door. Um, did you, Graham saying you've just started surveying. I saw the, the video, I think, um, uh, was it Lyndon put up uh, of the owl? You've already had success. This is definitely the way forward. Cool. Thank you. That's very kind, Graham. Yes. Um, the I will. I've mentioned about speaking at the the bat and the ARB conference, and I've been talking about this for a while. And I guess I haven't provided that. You know, I've just shared the worries as I mentioned earlier on. Haven't provided that option for. Okay, well, what do we do instead then? And um, I was chatting to the Avon Bat Group, and I. I really sorry i can't remember your name but the chap came up to me afterwards and we were chatting about it and um he came out with this line which i think was a famous quote from someone else which is don't let perfect be the enemy of good and i really like that we just need to have something that's better than we currently have and i honestly believe that we've got that evidence now we're through the, all the hard work of caris from the thousands of videos that Karis has looked at over the last few months. We've got the stats to back it up now. I had a really enjoyable afternoon chatting with Karis about that and all the wonderful graphs that she was showing me. I've limited to her to one graph at the, uh, the back conference because I mean like that. Um, but we've got the evidence now as well. So it's a step forward. And then hopefully we'll get to a point, I know that um, Gareth Lang 
has been working on a kind of uh, pre-record camera. I think a few other people have as well. And um, so, you know, there are, there are options here. It doesn't have to be one thing to fix it entirely now. It's just helping us step forward. Cool. Lovely. Okay. I am going to leave you all. Thank you for coming. As I mentioned, if you haven't helped, gone already over to the YouTube channel at Bats in Trees, why not? Go over there and click subscribe. And I will hopefully see some of you in person at the Bat Conference. Cheers for now.